All right, hi everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Today I'm going to present some work that I've done on uh, open data and give you a bit of insight as to why uh, nice people can share. And the reason I have uh, Union on there is that's because I, that's where I was based out of until recently in Switzerland where I did uh, most of this work. So uh, my background is actually in, in aquatic ecology and the data that I'll be presenting today is mainly from the fields of ecology and evolution, um, but I think they're fairly representative of what's happening in many other disciplines, so I hope that they'll be of interest to you as well. Um, I should also point out that meta-science isn't really the main focus of my research. As you can see on this photo, I, I work on fish, I do behavior and physiology, but um, I've been passionately studying open data in ecology and evolution for a couple of years now. Um, and also recently, I became an ambassador for the Center for Open Science and for the data repository Figshare. All right, so I think it's pretty fair to um, assume that most people here, if not anyone attending this conference, will agree that publications are not the only useful research out output, right? Um, scientists, researchers produce many more useful things than the traditional scientific article. And that's led some authors to argue that uh, the paper, in fact, is just an advertisement. Um, in reality, it's the data and their analyses that are the true scientific product. Um, and why is that? It's because the paper is only a few people's interpretation of um, some data. And therefore, um, it's limited in scope, um, it's limited in time, and it doesn't have that many uses. In contrast to that, um, the data are really what's necessary to validate the um, research results. And on top of that, they can be reused either by the original authors or by other people to ask other and potentially bigger questions and advance science more rapidly. And so given that, we can ask the question, well, do scientists have an obligation to make their data freely available? And I think that the general consensus in the scientific community is um, yes. And as a result of this, there's been, a big, there's been a big push in the biological sciences for open data. So many of you are probably familiar with um, editorial um, policies that require or promote open data. This is an example here from Ecology and Evolution. Um, so JDAP, as it's called, is a well-known policy now in our field. Lots of journals have adopted it, and it requires, um, as a condition of publication, that authors um, make their data publicly accessible on a repository. So many journals have adopted JDAP. These are some uh, examples here. And um, other journals in the field also might not have jumped onto this policy, but they've also, um, or journals that publish ecology and evolution work, um, they've adopted their own kind of strong open data policies that require sharing. And the kind of underlying objectives of these policies is to increase um, transparency and reproducibility so that um, scientists and the public can have confidence in the research results that are produced. So in theory, this is all well and good, right? Uh, researchers publish uh, papers, they archive their data, science progresses faster, and everybody is happy. Um, but uh, in reality, this is not necessarily how things are playing out. Um, and in fact, there's quite a bit of pushback, actually, by researchers who might be worried about making their data publicly available, even when they're required to do so by um, the journal's uh, policy where, where they publish. And so uh, this pushback is particularly apparent in fields like ecology and evolution, where data sets are often complex. Um, they can have a long shelf life, meaning that they uh, remain relevant for a long period of time. And um, they can also be used to test multiple different hypotheses. So here, in effect, researchers uh, might be worried about sharing their data for multiple reasons. One is, um, if they make their data open, they essentially open themselves to scrutiny and potential criticism. It might also be that um, they want to reuse their data for other purposes, and so if they make them public, they feel like they might get scooped because they've shared their data with others. So, if you don't believe me, here is uh, an example which I think uh, illustrates this problem really well. Um, this is an opinion piece that was written um, by a number of uh, very well-known authors in ecology and evolution. You can see that the list is very long here. Um, it was published in Trends in Ecology and Evolution, which is a well-read paper in my field. 
And these people tend to work on long-term data sets. Um, so they follow populations through time. And they write here that a key concern of theirs is that open data will be a disincentive both for the initiation of long-term studies, but also for the maintenance of ongoing studies. And what's interesting about this study is that um, these authors uh, completed a survey that they had designed, but they also sent it out to a bunch of other ecologists and evolutionary biologists. And um, what they got from this survey um, illustrates that 63% of these PIs were against open data as it currently stands. 41% of the respondents said that they had avoided publishing um, in journals that require open data. And I think even more worrisome, 53% of the uh, authors that completed this survey uh, intend to avoid publishing in journals that require open data in the future. And so um, I think this is pretty telling. Um, these are data from 2015, so they're not all that old. It's fairly recent. So given this pushback, we can um, kind of have a look at what the uh, data sharing trends have been in the fields of ecology and evolution. And thanks to some uh, great work by Tim Vines and, and others, um, there are some data that show that in fact there's a strong um, open, or that strong open data policies have had a very positive effect on data deposition rates. So um, data repositories are receiving more data and also more journals are um, adopting these open data policies. But it's worth, I think, stopping here for a minute and asking the very important question, um, does more actually mean better, right? And this is Im particularly important given the fact that most journals and databases we know don't have the resources um, necessary to verify the quality of archive data beyond performing basic checks, like um, verifying that there's a data availability statement and a DOI in the paper, um, or for example, data repositories checking that the files they receive are free of viruses. Um, so I was very interested in this, um, and this was towards uh, just after the end of my PhD, and I kind of wanted to ask the question, well, how well are we doing in ecology and evolution in terms of uh, the quality of the data that we are sharing? So this was a pretty big question. It took a lot of work to uh, kind of answer it, and so I teamed up with some colleagues of mine, um, and this led to a paper in PLOS Biology in 2015. And I'll just kind of quickly walk you through what we did and what we found. So um, we looked at 100 studies, non-molecular studies in ecology and um, evolution that were published in journals that had either adopted the JDAP, which I mentioned earlier, or had their own strong open data policy that mandates data sharing. So we looked at 50 studies here in 2012, 50 studies in 2013 across these seven journals that had strong open data policies um, during those, or that had implemented the, them before these years. And we assessed the quality of the data based on two criteria. First of all, were the data complete? So were all of the um, data necessary to reproduce the results in the paper um, archived on a repository? And um, finally, uh, and the second criteria was essentially, were these data reusable? Now, one thing that's important to point out here is that um, completeness is required by the policies of the journals, but reusability is not, right? We are interested in that um, in part because it aligns with um, the fair data principles that have been kind of developed within the force uh, community here, but this actually predates these, um, these uh, fair principles. So uh, I'm not going to give you the, the details of exactly how we scored this, but I just want to show you um, that essentially we had five scores basically for uh, assessing data completeness from one, uh, which meant very poor. There were no data, even though there were, something was archived on Dryad basically, um, there, were, there were no data there. People had, had either put an extra figure or they had put a summary statistics table that um, was not data. Um, and that went all the way up to five, which meant exemplary um, uh, completeness. Everything was there. All the variables that were mentioned in the paper were also in the uh, archive data set. And one uh, thing that's important to note here is that uh, a score of four or five meant that the authors had complied with the minimum requirements of the uh, journal policy where they had published. But a score of three uh, and below meant that the data set did not meet the minimum requirement of the journal's policy. 
And so we did a very similar thing with data reusability. Again, uh, um, scores from one to five. Um, and here we looked at things like, for example, um, uh, things that were indicative of poor reusability were uh, a format that made things very dis difficult to reuse. For example, like a JPEG of a spreadsheet. We've seen that. Um, <laughs> That's a very extreme case, but it's surprisingly enough, we found that. Um, very little metadata also that made it impossible to figure out what the abbreviations were in the data tables or what the column headings were also. Um, so these are the results, basically. Um, this is a graph showing the number of studies as a function of these, the score, basically, for data completeness from one to five. And I think you can all see here that um, you know, this is a pretty striking result, over um, half, so 56% of the studies did not meet the minimum requirement of their journal's open data policy. So what about um, data reusability? Well, we find uh, something similar or even potentially even more dramatic. 64% um, of the studies were archived in a way that either partially or entirely prevented reuse. So these, I think, are um, pretty sobering results. Um, and they beg the question, well, how do we increase um, high quality participation in open data? So if you know, a significant portion of the data that's uh, publicly available on these archives is in fact unusable, we need to fix that problem. Um, and there's kind of two strategies we can go uh, or use to go about doing this, right? One is we can use the stick method, so we can kind of beat people over the head with more policies and more enforcement. That might help, but we can also, um, you know, along, along that, um, offer some carrots, basically. So encourage good behavior by offering some rewards. So um, to kind of think about that a bit more, I got, with, uh, I got together with more colleagues in ecology and evolution to try and get a range of different opinions, basically, from people that are very favorable to open data to people that are actually quite against it. And the objective here was to get everyone together and kind of find a middle ground to formulate some recommendations for um, increasing participation and high quality participation in data archiving. So this led to another paper um, here called Troubleshooting Public Data Archiving, Suggestions to Increase Participation. And I don't have time to walk you through these recommendations, but if you're interested in them, um, I invite you to go and check out the, the paper. So instead, um, what I want to do with the remaining time that I have is to tell you about our latest findings uh, on this question. So we know that some people are not very keen on sharing their data. If we want to get them on board, we need to address their concerns, right? But what about the people that are keen to share their data, that want to do it? How well are these people doing? And so um, to kind of answer that question, I recruited uh, the help of some um, psychologists um, at the University of Neuchâtel in the Cognitive Science Center, and also um, some experimental psychologists from University College London. And I should point out also that um, a large chunk of this work was done by Aurelia Green, who was a master's student working with me. So we know from the slides that I presented to you earlier on that um, you know, authors don't do a great job of archiving their data, but there is some variation actually in the um, quality of open data across these hundred studies that we looked at. So we were interested in kind of trying to figure out what factors might explain this variance in these data completeness and data reusability scores that we obtained. And one important um, aspect that we had to keep in mind is the fact that data sharing is often perceived as an act of scholarly altruism, where um, the author incurs a cost for the benefit of the community. In this case, um, other researchers and the general uh, public. So also keeping in mind, I guess this question kind of came about and we were thinking about it um, as in the context of a, a paper published in 2014 in Nature Communications where the authors were interested in studying the generality of cooperation. Essentially, um, they designed a game, a computer game that could be sent out um, to uh, thousands of people to collect a lot of data and see whether people that cooperated in some situations also happened to cooperate in other unrelated situations. And so the results of this um, study led these authors to conclude that humans display what they call a cooperative phenotype um, that's domain general and temporally stable. So with that in mind, uh, we asked the question, well, do cooperative scientists share more and better? Um, is it possible that cooperative scientists score higher on these, um, uh, the evaluations we did of data completeness and data reusability? 
And to do that, um, we measured cooperation of those authors that had been responsible for archiving the data in the 100 studies that I mentioned um, from our 2015 paper. And so we did that in three different ways. First of all, we looked at the time that it, respond, uh, they, it took them to respond to a survey that was sent out to them by Aurelia, the graduate student working with me. And she specifically mentioned in the email that she was requesting their help in order to complete her master's degree. So um, in that survey, basically, we used a common psychology questionnaire to evaluate altruism. So the participants were essentially um, self-reporting their levels of altruism based on these questions. And then the third kind of measure of cooperation that we had was uh, in terms of charity donations. So once um, people had completed the survey before we debriefed them, we uh, entered them in a draw to win a $500 cash prize as a kind of reward for or a thank you for their participation. And then we gave them the option either to um, keep that $500 for them or they could donate either a part of it or all of it to a charity of their choice. I just wanted to highlight three um, important uh, aspects of this here. So the uh, emails um, that we sent out were personalized, and they were sent out um, based on the time zone where the specific researchers were located. So we tracked down all these researchers, found their emails, found where they were, and we sent these, the survey out on the Monday of our working week based on the time zone where they were located. We were sure to mention not only the author's names, but also um, their research to make sure that we grab their attention and increase the likelihood of them participating in our survey. And if they didn't respond to the first email we sent them, we would say we sent them three reminders over um, at an interval of one week. So essentially we gave them one month and four emails basically to participate in our survey. All this effort kind of paid, uh, paid off, sorry, we uh, ended up getting a response rate of 52 researchers out of the hundred that we had contacted, which for these types of survey is pretty good. Um, and I should also mention that all of this was pre-registered on uh, the OSF. All right, so how did, what, how did we look at the, uh, the results or the data basically from, from this survey? Um, we used the multivariate Bayesian model and we are specifically interested in looking at co-variation between um, data or cooperation in the context of data sharing and cooperation in other unrelated contexts with the measures that we used, right? So in this model, we also wanted to control for fixed effects, um, obvious things like gender and years out of PhD and also um, three kind of personality traits that that um, we had assessed using questions and that are, are thought to be important in potentially influencing the quality of uh, the data that these people might share. So um, here are some first results from this model. You don't have to worry too much about this figure, largely because um, there's not very much happening, actually. Uh, we found that donations increased with the number of years out of PhD. Makes sense. Um, we also found that uh, the response time to a survey decreased with um, researchers' levels of conscientiousness. And interestingly, we found that um, people that scored high on a social desirability scale took more time to respond to this survey. Now, the, a possible explanation for this might be that um, these people weren't all that helpful at first. They got this email and they didn't really want to do much with it. But after a couple of reminders, they might want to look good in the eyes of their peers and so finally decide that, okay, they're going to fill it in and, and send it back to us. But um, So these are the data that we're really interested in here. This is a, a correlation matrix um, showing these two measures of uh, data sharing, so um, data reusability, data completeness, and in blue here, um, we have the three measures of cooperation in these other contexts, right? So self-report altruism, um, response time to the survey, and the charity donation. So um, we find, first of all, that there's a, a strong positive relationship between data completeness and reusability. Not so surprising, we knew that from the study that we had done in 2015. What about the rest? Again, there's not very much happening here. Um, so there are some kind of trends for some correlations there, but they're not particularly strong. So I should just mention here that obviously there, there are a few caveats to this study. There's also some strengths. I'll start with the strengths. Um, first of all, we looked at real world instances of cooperation. So we think this is fairly informative, potentially more so than having people participate in these kind of artificial games on a computer. Um, 
Second of all, we focus on the quality of uh, shared data versus only looking at whether people had shared something or not, because what that something is varies a lot. So it's very important to look at actually the content of these shared data. And obviously, kind of one of the most um, obvious limitations is that our sample size uh, for this part of the study is fairly limited. Um, it's, still, it's still a big effort, hard data to obtain, but it's still an N of 52 for a model that is fairly complex. So to kind of verify whether the conclusions we get from this analysis would actually hold up to scrutiny, we uh, conducted a simpler analysis that is much more powerful um, with a larger sample size. So these graphs here will show you data completeness, so a score again from one to five, data reusability, and um, we're gonna compare the scores of people that responded to the survey versus the scores of people that did not respond to the survey, right? So I'll remind you that we had 52 respondents, 48 non-respondents, and we think that this is a pretty good measure of cooperation because, like I said, Aurelia was explicit in requesting help and also it's pretty easy to track down researchers. We knew we had their most current email address and we didn't get any bounce back. So we know, or we're pretty certain that these people got our email. We gave them a month to reply, three reminders, I'm pretty sure they got it. So. What do we find? Again, not very much, basically. So um, this is a simple Wilcoxon test, high powered, no difference between data completeness and data reusability between people that cooperated and did not cooperate. Um, so what does this mean? Um, does it mean that this idea of a cooperative phenotype doesn't apply to real life context and doesn't extend to data sharing? Um, we don't think so. Um, it's probably not that people who are co cooperative suddenly decide that um, they don't want to share their data and be unhelpful. Um, instead, um, we think our data suggests that um, nice people can't share. Um, in effect, they're not any better than other, at sharing their data than other people that uh, act left, less cooperatively, cooperatively sorry, and also um, report themselves as being less altruistic. And so I guess to me, uh, the most straightforward explanation um, of these data is that even though most of us researchers are well-intended and, and helpful people, um, we lack proper training in data management, right? Um, even though we want to share our data, we're not very effective at doing so. Um, and so I guess the, the, the good news here is that there is actually an easy fix for this, right? Provide better data or better training in data management. And um, I think this is kind of an obvious conclusion, but in reality, there's not very much empirical data that points to the importance of training in this context. But fortunately for us, um, there exists a lot of initiatives and efforts to train researchers to become better at managing their data and sharing it. These are just two examples of ones that, uh, that you're probably familiar with, um, but there's a whole suite of other ones out there. And I think that the time is just about ripe now to test whether these efforts have actually produced the desired result, especially um, since the data that we collected dated back from 2012-13, we're in 2018 now. There's five years basically where this has been ongoing, let's see how um, things have progressed. And this is a, a, more or less where I'm at now. So um, in conclusion, basically, I think that we're not quite there yet, but the future um, is looking fairly bright for open data. Thanks very much. And I'd love to get some questions or comments, obviously. Yeah. Okay, great job. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. This is, this, this is what we need to be talking about, okay? Why they don't share, okay? So I've, I've thought about this and presented on it, and I work with scientists every day, and I am a scientist, yep. okay? And my favorite comment on why I don't share is it's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. They're very busy, okay? Waste of time. Why is it a waste of time? So I managed to get the second question in before the scientist ran <laughs> off to, back to the lab, okay? Why is it a waste of time? because the data cannot be reused. Ah, cannot be reused. So let's think about that. Why can't it be reused? Because our current data collection curation mechanisms that they have access to cannot provide the context information necessary mm. to tell whether that data can be reanalyzed or, or belongs in some future work, 
Okay? There just isn't enough context information. So in clinical science, if you record a blood pressure, everybody knows, okay, that's a blood pressure, and you, all you have to say is, this was collected in a clinic. Everybody knows what that means, okay? In metabolomic science, if you say, I used mass spectroscopy to determine that this molecule of, of atomic weight 253 actually is X, you have to provide tremendous context okay, about how you did that before anybody is going to believe you or reuse that data. Okay? And the, the kind of deposit mechanisms we have, the kind of data systems we have, the kind, everything we've got is insufficient for, you know, for, for that kind of data reuse. And so they just walk away. It's, it's, you know, it, it's a waste of time. They cannot reuse the data. If they want to reuse the data, they'd have to talk to me. That's the final thing they say. You know, I, I, I deposited my data, but the, only con the way to get the context for that data is to talk to the scientists, and I can answer all the questions about how the data was actually collected. They don't want to do that, a waste of time. So that's where they are. I, it's an interesting comment. I hear that excuse, or excuse, I, he yeah, I hear that reason all the time. <laughs> exactly. So I'm in an interesting situation because I'm an empirical like, scientist as well, and I came into this and I started getting interested in open data. Um, yeah, thinking also not necessarily being very pro-open data. And as time went by, I thought about it some more. And I said, well, this makes a lot of sense, you know, for all sorts of different reasons. But what, what I was hearing from my colleagues at the very beginning was also par partly that people are worried that their data are going to be misinterpreted and misused. This is one of the, I forgot to mention that actually when I kind of stated people are worried that they're going to be criticized. People are worried that um, they're going to be scooped. But they, they're also worried that their data is going to be misinterpreted and misused. And for me, I think, well, first of all, that's the role of metadata as well to make sure that they're well described. But what's interesting is I like to study these things from an empirical point of view. I like to show people some data and some evidence. And the reality is there's there's very little evidence to show that people are misinterpreting data, actually. So um, the, I know of one case where that's happened, and that's led to a bit of correspondence in the journal, basically, and some disagreements. But it is so infrequent, lots of people um, reuse data, and that doesn't seem to happen very often. The thing is, if you tell people that, they're still not going to believe you. And so my solution to it is, well, let's study it, and let's produce some data and some evidence, basically, and then people can make up their own minds, right? One sh last yeah. short question and short answer. I mean, this was wonderful, <coughs> Mike. Uh, Did you ask last... them, as part of the questionnaire, whether they found it difficult to deposit data? Whether um, no, we did not, actually. Partly, in, that was in part because the questionnaire was kind of meant, so we debriefed them at the end and told them what the purpose of the study was, but we did not want them to know initially that we were actually looking at their, or comparing their cooperation in other contexts to data sharing, because we would have been priming them, basically. So I worked with psychologists on this to make sure that I wasn't going to mess it up, and that was definitely one of the things we had to be very careful about, was to not prime them. I guess we could have asked them afterwards. Um, we did not do that. And in part, I think, because these data were collected also back in 2012-13 initially, like the data about the quality um, or the completeness and reusability. And I, my feeling was these people would have probably forgotten how it was back then, basically. Um, but I intend to pursue the research on this and kind of look at how things have been developing over the years. So I think it's a good point and something to keep in mind for what's going to happen next. Thanks.